Okay, and we are recording in case there are any internet issues either on my end or your end. Okay, um, so a couple of couple of things then. Um, let's start with the exam. I'm still in the process of grading that. Um, the the raw, the raw score that you get on web campus is not necessarily your final score for, for exam one. Uh, the reason for that is that there, there are, um, with, with the, the way that web campus is programmed, uh, I have to put in every single possible correct answer, which isn't, it, that, that's not the bad thing. The bad thing is that sometimes I forget uh, or I don't uh, think of an input that, that uh, would be correct, but you know, that I hadn't thought of. So take, for example, if you were doing a thing on units and let's say hypothetically, the answer was 27 miles per hour. If I thought, all right, if you're, if you're gonna put uh, MPH to abbreviate miles per hour, I put that in and it would accept that answer. Uh, but if you write it out miles per hour and I, and I forget to include that, then it would mark it wrong. So I call those input errors um, just cause it's the way that it's programmed and it's the input. Um, so if you do have the correct answer, but it's an input error, so it's, it's um, an answer that is correct, but in a different form than what, what I had uh, thought to put, um, then you'll receive the points for that. And the other part of that too is with the scratch paper, even if your, your quest, even, sorry, even if your answer is wrong, um, I wanna take a look at your scratch work and see if you had, had the, uh, the right idea and I can give partial points for work towards the correct answer. So that's, that's the reason why it's not, why the raw score is not necessarily your final score for that, for that exam. Uh, and I'll be going through that this weekend that will probably be done, I'm hoping no later than Monday. Um, so those scores will be, will be updating. So that's what I wanted to say about the final exam, or not the final exam, the, the uh, first exam. Um, there are also some emails that you sent me. Uh, there were some emails I received about some errors on the exam or some errors that some individuals had. Um, and I will be addressing those as well, uh, but I, I didn't want, I wanted to uh, leave those um, emails as unread. In my, even though I've, I've seen them, I keep them marked as unread uh, until I can have time to look in, in, at it in detail. Uh, so I did, I did receive those. I will be looking through those and potentially giving points back for that as well. Um, so uh, just be aware of that. So that's, that's what I wanted to say about the uh, test one. Uh, the other thing is for the, for the project then, uh, remember the project is uh, due this coming Sunday, February 28th at 11.59 p.m. Excuse me, 11.59 p.m. Um, just as, as a quick summary, I did send out an email reminder about that, but just uh, repeating some things here. Um, for part one, you're looking for two arguments that have uh, logical fallacies, uh, two different arguments. So um, it can be from the same source as long as it's, it's not both from social media. You can use social media only once on part one, um, but uh, two different arguments. Uh, so you will state, you know, cite the source, uh, of course, have all of the information um, if it's an article, who was the author, uh, where was it published, who was published online, what is the HTML, all of that information that you would need. Um, and then, you know, stating the, the premises and the conclusion, and then a short paragraph or two explaining the fallacy, and uh, uh, what fallacy was shown in the argument and how that fallacy worked in that argument, in that context. And then part two is one extra argument uh, where you analyze that in detail, um, where you go through, again, you cite the source, you state the, the premises and then the conclusion, and then you draw a Venn diagram and uh, you have a paragraph or two after um, explaining the analysis. So is it valid? Is it sound? Um, and with that, there was, an, there was a question that was asked about um, some help with finding some sources on that. I'm going to go through and, and uh, try and send an email tonight about that. So, um, but that is that is due this this Sunday. Another note, uh, and I, I did mention this in the email, but I want to mention it again here. Um, this is a group project. And so every group member is expected to um, put forth an equal amount of work. Uh, so if, if, uh, if your group has been unable to contact you, or if you have been actively avoiding your group, uh, then I may have to drop you from that group and put you into a solo group 
Um, especially since we are so close to the deadline, most of the work might already have been finished by your group members, and that's not fair. Um, so just just be aware that 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 could potentially happen. Um, because this is supposed to be a group project. Every group member is supposed to contribute um, equally into the workload there. So, um, so be aware of that. Um, also, while I'm while I'm thinking about groups uh, for this next project, um, for the project for theme two, I am going to be uh, creating different randomized groups. So this this um, I use Web Campus to randomize this. Uh, the groups this this uh, this round. I'll do the same thing for the next group project. So it won't be the same groups. And part of the reason for that is um, I believe this next project will need a few. Um, I think we'll we'll do groups of four or five uh, because of the project uh, itself. So um, so those are the those are the things that I wanted to mention um, before we get started. Uh, let me switch here. Oh, oh, good question. Uh, that was that was the other thing I wanted to mention. That's a good question. Um, the question is, and, and I have to repeat this for the recording. Uh, does everyone in the group have to submit the project on Canvas, or one can one person submit it for the whole group? Um, the answer there is, uh, I believe that there will only be one submission for the group. Um, there is a setting on Web Campus, I believe, where you can set it to where uh, there's a submission for the groups that have been set. Uh, so if I can figure that out, it will be through that. Uh, and that way it will just be one submission per group because it will be uh, that submission will count for everyone that is in that assigned group. Um, worst case scenario, if I can't figure that out, which is a possibility because technology and I don't always uh, go well together. Um, Worst case scenario, you would just send me, uh, you would have one person in the group send me an email and then carbon copy your group members' emails um, with the attached file. That way everyone has has the uh, final submission. Uh, let's see, I have another question here. Is it okay if we have a co cover page including our names and our group number? Yes, that is actually uh, perfectly acceptable. That's actually not a bad idea. I might, I might start incorporating that um, into the into the group projects from here on out. That's a really good idea. Um, yes, absolutely. If you want to have a cover page that has your your names and group number, that that would be perfect. Um, if not, be, because I didn't have it in this one, uh, if you don't, obviously you won't lose points for it. But that is actually a very, very good idea. Um, OK, uh, so that's what I wanted to say there. Let me switch screens. But while I'm switching screens, if you have any questions on that, any of that um, that I talked about or any questions in general, uh, let me know and I can address those um, while I'm getting ready for the lecture today. Otherwise, we'll continue on. Uh, let me, whenever I share screens, I lose the chat. There you are. OK, and let me move that to the correct area on my screen. OK, all right. Okay, um, I didn't hear any questions and I don't see any in chat. So we'll continue on. Um, obviously, again, I do know that uh, typing on some devices is difficult. So I'll keep my eye on chat and there, there is a little bit of a delay. Uh, so I'll answer questions as I see them. Uh, but until I see questions, we'll continue on. Um, so we finished theme one. That was the first third of the semester. So we have two more themes, basically two more parts, part two, part three, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, so theme two is where we are at, and this is going to cover chapters uh, four. And for four, we're going to have a lecture on 4A, uh, 4B, and 4D. We're going to have a reading check on 4C. Uh, we'll have, uh, maybe I should just have that singular, chapter four, chapter five. And here we'll have a lecture on 5C and 5E, and on chapter uh, six, 
uh, well, we'll have uh, 6a, 6b, and 6c. Um, so that's going to be our, our theme too. Um, a lot of this is covering, uh, well, I guess chapter four is covering, covering uh, financial information, um, budgeting and, and uh, things of that nature. Oh, uh, that's a good question. Is group project the only assignment due this Sunday? Um, I believe at the moment, uh, well, it, I guess that depends on where we where we get in lecture today. I don't think we'll get very far. There might be one, uh, one or two. Um, well, I think okay. <laughs> Sorry, let me let me let me gather my thoughts. I think we'll finish one section today. So I think we'll have four um, A reading check and homework uh, due. Uh, but besides the project, there's not going to be much more besides that. Um, I don't want to overwhelm you guys with homework. So even if we do finish uh, 4B, that won't be due this weekend. Um, well, that's actually a fair argument. Um, Yeah, I'm I'm okay with that. Let's let's go ahead and make the project be the only thing due this weekend. Yeah, uh, we will finish. Uh, I'm pretty sure we will finish section four a. Uh, so you should be able to finish the homework if you have time. But let's let's not let's not stress you guys out too much, uh, especially since we just had the exam. We have the project due this weekend. Um, uh, let's let's not have anything else due this weekend. Uh, okay. So let's go ahead and, and jump into this then. Um, oh, the uh, so for chapter four, the reading check 4C, we're not going to lecture on 4C, um, but there will be a reading check on it. That is going to be the last section uh, well, that, where that will be the case. So um, in chapters uh, one, two, and three, there were extra sections I wanted you guys to read. Um, so chapter four is going to be the last one that will have that. Uh, and then after that, all of the reading checks and, and homework will, will be what we lecture on. Um, so just wanted to mention that. Okay, so let's, let's uh, start section 4A. So 4A, the authors title this uh, Taking Control of Your Finances. And uh, the first thing that we're going to start off with here is a four-step uh, budget-making method. Now, um, I do want to be a little bit careful with this. Um, this is not the only way to make a budget. Uh, this might not only this might not even be the um, most efficient way to make a budget. Uh, these this is these are the steps that the author use uh, that the authors use, and definitely will work. Um, if you have a, a class in finances, I would um, I would stick to what they say. But for the purposes of of homework and and this class, uh, this is the method we're going to use. So we have uh, four steps here. So step one, going to determine your average monthly income. And for this, uh, the way that the authors have this, uh, we're going to include an average monthly amount for any income that you do not uh, receive monthly. So take, for example, if you have a summer job uh, that is only a couple of months out of the year that you are, uh, that you are working each year, uh, you're still going to include that. You're going to uh, include that in your yearly uh, your yearly income and then divide that by 12 to get you your average monthly in income. So you're including um, amounts for any income that that is not monthly income. So things like uh, summer jobs. Okay, step two. You're going to determine 
your average monthly expenses. And so again, here, uh, the authors were going to include an average monthly expense for any um, expenses that do not occur uh, monthly. So that would include things like uh, tuition, since you're only paying that at the beginning of the semesters, or textbooks. Again, you're only paying that at the beginning of the semester is going to include that. Uh, if you have, uh, take, for example, a summer vacation that you usually go on, going to include expenses for that. And once you get the expenses for the whole year, you divide that by 12, and that will give you your average monthly expenses. So here, uh, we're including in both the, the income and the expenses uh, things that, that do not occur every single month, but that will occur uh, during the year. Okay. Step three, you're going to determine your net monthly income. And so for the, for the net monthly income, uh, once you have determined your net monthly expenses and your net monthly income, uh, sorry, um, your average monthly income, then the net monthly income, uh, which we'll call cash flow, the uh, monthly cash flow is going to be given by uh, the income, uh, average income minus the expenses. And we'll see some examples of, of using that. We'll, we'll uh, I think it's relatively straightforward, but that's, that's what we mean by the, the uh, cash flow is the net monthly income. Uh, so it's your uh, monthly income minus your monthly expenses. And that's your cash flow. And then, oops, sorry, uh, step four, you're going to uh, make adjustments as needed. All right, so with, with the cash flow, um, as a note with that, the cash flow can be positive, uh, negative, or zero. Um, if it's negative, that's the worst case scenario, uh, because if it's negative, that means that you're spending more money than you make. And that's not, not a good situation to be in. Uh, if it's zero, you're breaking even. And if it's positive, then you have, uh, then you're spending less money than you make uh, for that month. So op op uh, uh, optimally, you want a positive net cash flow. And you can, um, for step four, you're making adjustments. So that, that is if you, if you uh, analyze your uh, cash flow, your, your monthly cash flow, and that's negative, uh, then there might be something in your budget that you can cut out or cut down on uh, to reduce your, your monthly expenses. That way you won't have... Um, hopefully we won't have a negative cash flow. And as a note here, let's just uh, formalize this for our, for our notes. Um, the cash flow can be negative and that, uh, which means you are spending more than you make. Okay. And let's look at an example for this. Um, so an example for this might be something like John uh, makes, let's say, $2,000 per month uh, and has the following expenses, let's say um, $600 per month in rent. Oh, I keep forgetting that this does that when I'm in the text mode. Sorry about that. Uh, in rent, uh, let's say $200 per month on food. Uh, let's say uh, $35 per week on entertainment. And let's do $500 per year in insurance. And let's uh, determine John's 
uh, monthly net cash flow. Okay. So here we have a hypothetical situation. We have this uh, individual, John, We're told how much he makes uh, and what his expenses are. Obviously, um, in the real, real world, there would be, this would be a lot more detailed. There'd be a lot more expenses than this probably. And some of these expenses are probably not as, as accurate as they should be. Um, but we can, from this hypothetical situation, determine the, the uh, monthly net cash flow. Okay, now um, for this, let's not, let's not forget what we already know, uh, what we've already learned. And for that, um, in this particular example, what I'm talking about are units. So you'll notice here, we want the monthly net cash flow. And so if we look at the units that we have here, this one is per month, this one is per month, but these ones are different. This one, well, this one's per month. This one is per week and this one is per year. So we want, uh, if we want the monthly net cash flow, we want all of those units to be uh, in, in a, the month unit. And here, let's, uh, let's assume that there are four weeks per month. And that will, that will be given if you have something like that. Uh, something like that will be stated uh, so you don't have to make any assumptions there so that the uh, answer will come out the same for everyone. Um, usually, I think in these examples, we, we do four weeks per month because uh, in general, um, well, February is the shortest month and that has four weeks. So that will cover every month. Uh, there might be an extra week or two for some months, but we'll we'll just say four, uh, for the purposes of this of this class. All right. So, the income we have. Let's go ahead and list this out, and then we'll do the cash flow equation. The income was two thousand dollars per month, so we are good there on the units. The expenses. We have $600 per month on rent. That is, again, in the uh, month units for our time, so that's good. Uh, we have $200 per month on food. We have 35 per week. on entertainment. So that we will have to fix. And then 500 per year on insurance. So that will have to fix as well. Okay, so the per week, uh, since we're assuming there are four weeks in the month, we're going to multiply that by four. So we would do four times 35. Let me use our calculators. Did I have, I did not, sorry. <laughs> I thought I had everything ready to go. I forgot to bring out my calculator. Bring out your calculators, go ahead and, and do that. Four times 35. And what do we get then as the monthly entertainment expense? In this case, 140. Ah, good, I'm seeing that in chat, excellent. Okay, the next part here, this is per year. Well, we know there are 12 months in a year. So here we would divide by 12, 500 divided by 12. And we would get $41 and that's around two decimal places since we're talking about uh, money here, uh, 67 cents per month. Okay. Now that everything is in terms of the month, uh, what you could do, you have, well, you have several different options here. You can add up all of the expenses and then just take the income minus the expenses, or you can just do it all in, in one go. So our cash flow here for John is going to be $2,000 minus the 600 for rent, minus the 200 for food, minus the 140 for entertainment, and minus the 4167 for insurance. And so we can do this all in, again, in 
in one step. Uh, so again, we use our calculators. We do 2,000 minus the 600 minus 200 minus 140 and minus 4167. And in this case, we have uh, $1,000. $18.33 is the cash flow. OK. Uh, so yeah, that, that is the, uh, hopefully the other examples I give you will be a lot more accurate than this. But um, is this a good situation or a bad situation for John to be in? It's good. Good, yes. Uh, I think that in the chat as well. Uh, why? Because he has a positive cash flow. Because he has a positive cash flow. Excellent. Yep. Uh, best case scenario, you have a positive cash flow. So, what could you do with this extra amount? Well, that depends on who you ask. You could put it towards retirement, put it in savings. Um, you could put it into an emergency fund. Um, all of those would be good. You can invest it. Um, you could uh, use some of it to upgrade your computer. <laughs> Again, depends on who you ask and what would be the, the best situation there. So um, that's kind of getting into relative territory. It depends on your life situation and what you really need. Although savings are uh, usually never a bad, a bad idea to go with. Okay, um, so that's cash flow. And that comes from our budgeting. Um, the next thing that we have uh, in this section are comparing expenses. So comparing expenses, um, there are a couple of different ways to compare expenses. Uh, there we have uh, two different ways that we're going to look at, at least in, in this section. And the first way is comparing, uh, well, we're going to two, two different ways uh, using percentages is actually what we're going to look at. Um, so the first one we can look at is comparing one expense as a percentage of another. Um, and so in, in this type of situation, we would look at, all right, um, our entertainment budget, for example, is 25% of what our food budget is. So you can compare two expenses in that way in terms of percentages. Uh, the other way that we have is comparing one expense um, as a percentage of annual income. Uh, annual or monthly income. Let's just say let's just say income. And so in this case, you could say, all right, our food budget is twenty, uh, say twenty-seven percent of our income, uh, and and that's that's another good way to to look at expenses. Uh, so let's look at some examples for both of these. So again, we can compare two expenses directly by saying, all right, if I have, uh, say, my food budget and my entertainment budget, I can say, well, what percent of my food budget is my entertainment budget and compare it in that way. Uh, and the other way is to take, all right, here's my food budget. That is what percent of my income. And those are the two ways that we're going to look at, look at these. Uh, so the first example, let's compare uh, two expenses. Let's uh, pick on John again, since we're, we're already talking about John. Uh, let's say John spends $15 per week on lottery tickets and $140 per month on food. And what we want to know is on an annual basis, the amount spent on lottery tickets is what percent of the amount spent on food. Okay, so here we are comparing two expenses. For John, we're comparing uh, lottery tickets, uh, the lottery ticket expense and the food expense. Now you'll notice there are a couple of things here. We're given, again, we want to pay attention to our units, 
and we don't want to forget what we've already learned. Uh, so here we're doing uh, $15 per week on lottery tickets, and we have $140 per month on food. Uh, but it's also important to pay attention to the units we want for our solution. Notice this says on an annual basis. And so that means we're looking at in terms of, a, of one year, um, what percent of uh, the lottery tickets is what percent of the amount on food. And so here, since we're looking for a percent, this is going to be the, the uh, yearly expense of the lottery. Let's just uh, abbreviate that. And that's yearly, since we're looking at the annual amount, divided by the expense of food. And again, that's yearly, since we're looking at the annual amount. Okay, and then this whole thing uh, times 100 to get us into percent form. So we need uh, those two things. We need to know what is our uh, lottery expense for the entire year? What is our food expense for the entire year? Uh, now, here's, here's one thing um, that is going to be important in, in this problem and in, uh, in several problems, actually, in this uh, chapter four, uh, expense chapter, finance chapter. Uh, how many weeks are in a year? And the answer there is there are 52. And I heard that very good. I just beat you to it. There are 52 weeks per year. So when we are looking at a month on a monthly basis, if we're given, so if we're given uh, an amount per week and we're given a, looking at say the monthly budget or on a monthly basis, then um, we will be told how many weeks to use as a month. I, I believe this book usually uses four, four weeks per month. Uh, if we're using a yearly basis and we're given the amount per week, then we are going to do 52 weeks per year. So there, there are uh, how many weeks per year? 52. 52, good. Seeing that in chat, good. Uh, from someone else, how many, how many weeks are there per year? 52. 52, good. Uh, from someone else there, how many weeks per year? 52. 52, okay. 52, yes. So uh, hopefully I've emphasized how important that. Uh, 26 paydays every year. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Uh, oh, that also might depend on your employer. It might be uh, uh, 12, 12 uh, payments per year if you're doing monthly. But yeah, so good. 52, <laughs> 52 weeks per year. Um, that is going to be a very, uh, very important. Um, uh, my brain just dropped the word conversion factor for us. Okay, so let's go ahead and finish finish up this this um, this particular problem. All right, so we have $15 per week on lottery tickets. So we have $15 per week. And we are looking at 52 weeks per year. Oh, that's a good question. Will I include that on tests? Um, this one I'm torn on. I'm leaning towards no. I'm leaning towards I won't include that on tests. Um, I might. Let's just go with let's just go with no for now. I, I will not include that on tests. Um, all right, so 15 times 52, so there are 52 weeks in a year, gives us $780 as the yearly expense um, for the lottery. All right, and then for food, uh, we have $140 per month. And there are 12 months per year. So we do 140 times 12, and we get $1,680 as our yearly expense for food. So the uh, now, now we wanna find what is the percent of the amount, uh, sorry, the lottery tickets is what percent of the amount spent on food. So that's going to be the uh, lottery ticket is the 780 and we'd have our 
dollars divided by our 1680, and we'd have our dollars times 100. And I just wanted to emphasize the units there because those will cancel. And so this will give us a percent. We do 780 divided by our 1680 and then times 100. Let's round to two decimal places, 46.43%. So uh, John's lottery, uh, lottery ticket expenses are 46%, almost 50%, almost half of his food budget. Um, when we're comparing expenses like this, we can get a percent that is over 100. So if it was 150%, uh, then that's uh, one and a half times the would be one and a half times the food budget. Um, that is that is the first way we can compare expenses. So in this case, the lottery ticket. Uh, maybe we should type that out. Um, so the lottery ticket expense is forty six point four three percent of his food expense. Uh, per year on an annual basis. So that is one way to compare expenses. All right, uh, the other way we have of comparing expenses is to compare an expense to the entire amount of income. Uh, so let's look at an example of that. So let's say that Maria's net income after tax is $3,000 per month. And let's say that she spends $10 per week on lottery tickets. And we want what we want to know is uh, on an annual basis, the amount spent on lottery tickets is what percent of her income. Okay. So here we're comparing an expense to the uh, total amount of income. And so again, here, since we're looking for a percent, that's going to be the, uh, the lottery tickets expense. So we have the lottery ticket expense uh, yearly, since we're on an annual basis again divided by the total amount of income. And again, this is on an annual basis. So that is yearly. And then times 100 to get us into percent form. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think I can make this fit on this page. <laughs> I need to uh, organize my pages better. Uh, so let's find the uh, total amount of income per year. Okay, so that is three three thousand per month uh, times twelve to get us uh, the yearly amount. So that's going to give us thirty six thousand for our yearly income. Uh, so that was three thousand per month, and then we have ten dollars per week on lottery tickets. So on the lottery tickets, there are how many weeks per year? 52, very good, I'm seeing that in chat. So times 52? 52. 52, very good. So we get uh, 10 times 52 is 520. So the percent is going to be the 520 divided by the 36,000. And then again, times 100 to get us into percent form And that's round to two decimal places. So we'll get 1.44%. Okay. Um, now, after we have determined this, this percentage, um, both in this, this uh, example and the previous one, um, questions can't, you can analyze this in terms of your budget. You can say, all right, um, is 1.4% of my income an acceptable amount? For the amount I'm spent, I'm spending on the lottery. Uh, now, this is again, this is getting into relative territory. This might depend on who you are. Uh, some individuals would say the uh, 
the amount you should spend on the lottery should be zero. Uh, others will say, well, 1.44% isn't too bad as long as you're, you know, living within your means. Uh, but that that comes comes down to again personal uh, relative um, relative question relative situation what is what is right for you and uh, your family if you're budgeting for for a, for a family um, and you could also get into other questions too like all right well if it was if it was fourteen percent would that be would that be acceptable should it be more should it be less uh, if we're looking at another expense like take for example our food if we're spending fifty percent. Uh, if our if our lottery budget is fifty percent, is half the amount that we spend on food per year, is that acceptable, or should it be should it be less? Um, so, comparing this again, that gets into some relative questions, and that that depends on your your personal situation and your your family for budgeting for a family. Uh, but that's that's where you would go with these um, once you compare these expenses. All right, so let's. Look at the last little bit. So that's that's um, looking at expenses in terms of uh, uh, first in terms of other expenses and then in terms of the uh, total amount of or the I guess the net amount of income. Um, this next example is actually kind of going to uh, be leading us into the next section. Uh, this is a question on interest, uh, and we're going to be talking about interest, uh, both simple interest and compound interest, in the next section. Uh, so this one is just kind of a, a lead-in question to the next uh, to the next uh, material that we'll be covering, uh, but the book did include it. So I believe there's I think I want to say two or three questions from the section on that. Uh, but let's let's look at the example. Okay, so here's an example. Let's say that you maintain an average balance of five hundred dollars on your credit card, which carries uh, a 24% annual interest rate. And what we want to know is um, what is the amount you will pay on interest each month? And we're going to assume that the monthly rate for the credit card is one twelfth the annual rate, one twelfth times the annual rate, which would make sense since there are 12 months per year. OK. Uh, so again, this. Can I interrupt a second? What yes. do you mean by a balance on the credit card? Does that mean you? have $500 extra in there, or does that mean you owe 500? Uh, that means that you owe 500. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, sorry, that, yeah, that's that's a little bit of a, now that now that you've asked that, I can see how that would be ambiguous. So yeah, the, the 500 balance here, I mean, this is what you owe. Very good. Um, okay, so um, in this case, uh, again, we're getting into interest, so, um, the amount, so let's just write this down, the amount that we owe in interest will be some percent of the monthly uh, balance. And again, we do have to be careful with our, with our units here. We're talking about uh, per month, so we're looking at monthly balance. Um, and so the amount we, uh, the, the annual, the monthly, sorry, the monthly interest rate, we're going to assume is one twelfth the annual interest rate. So we can say that the monthly interest rate then is going to be one twelfth of our annual, which is 24%. And so here we'll get 2%. And so the amount of interest we owe per month, if we keep that average amount of 500, that average balance of 500 is 2% of 500. So the amount we own interest, uh, let's write this down, interest will be 2% of the balance, which is 500. And 
This we know how to handle. Whenever we have a percent, we want that in decimal form, 0 0.02. And some percent of a number, we multiply the decimal form of the percent to the number, so 0 0.02 times 500. And in this case, I believe that comes out to 10 times 500, $10, yeah. So that is the amount that we'll owe in interest. Again, if we want to, we want to keep that balance of $500. Uh, so you'd be paying $10 for the interest, and then on top of that, whatever amount is due um, according to the bank, whichever, or um, credit card company, uh, whichever one you're going through here. Um, okay, so uh, any questions uh, or comments on anything up to here? Oh, the 2%. Um, so here we're looking at uh, that's a good question. We're looking at what is our, uh, what is the amount we want to pay on interest per month? And so for that, we're given the annual interest rate. Uh, so what we need is the monthly interest rate. So we assume that the monthly interest rate is one twelfth of the annual interest rate because there are 12 months per year. So we, we take the annual interest rate, 24%, uh, divide that by 12 and that gives us our 2%. Um, any other questions on this one? or anything up to this point. Okay, uh, so that's section 2A. Oh, um, yes, so that's, that's a good question too. I do, I, do have to, uh, I do have to repeat it for the recordings and I think also um, for, for the others uh, in chat. Will you always, put the assume monthly rate on the questions and the answer for that is yes so for things like tests. So um, if this were to appear on, on the test, I would have there this, um, excuse me, the, the assume monthly rate equals one twelfth of the annual rate that would appear on the exam somewhere. Yes, uh, that's a good question. Um, any other questions? Okay. And I'll keep my eye on chat to see if there are any. Uh, but that's section 4A. Um, uh, let's, let's do a little bit in section 4B. Again, I don't want to overwhelm you with homework. So we won't have 4A due this weekend. Let's have that due next weekend. Uh, but I do want to go over just a little bit in section 4b just as kind of a kind of an introduction to our, where we're going here um, for those of you that have had I, I think this might be in 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 some math courses I'm, I'm not entirely sure which ones uh, which ones they put this in but we'll be looking at simple interest and compound interest um, so 4b the authors entitled this the power of compounding uh, so I believe um, I have a really hard time finding examples of anything that uses simple interest these days. Uh, that doesn't mean that it it doesn't exist, but I I think the majority of things that you will see will be using compound interest. But we'll we'll talk about both in in the course. Um, and in terms of things like investing, definitely you would want the interest to be compound interest. Um, in terms of uh, things like uh, loans or credit cards, you would want it to be simple interest, but the banks would want it to be compounding. So uh, let's go over some terms that we'll be using. All right, so the first one is principal. The principal in financial formulas is the balance on which interest is paid. So here, um, the principal or principal amount, usually they drop amount because they assume that you know that that's what that means. Uh, the principal is is what you are, is the balance on which interest is paid, either the uh, balance that is owed or the balance that, that uh, was invested. Um, simple interest is interest paid only on the original investment amount and not on any interest added at later dates. 
So when we're talking about simple interest, um, for a simple interest, the interest is determined only by the initial amount that was invested or borrowed, period, that's it. Um, the amount in the account, either in the investment or the amount owed will change again, depending on how much uh, interest is added. But the when interest is calculated, it is calculated only on the original investment amount. Uh, compound interest, on the other hand, let me, actually let's let's make a note here. So for for a simple interest, the principal amount does not change. The principal amount does not change. It will always be whatever the initial investment was, because uh, again, we're only calculating interest from the original investment amount. Uh, compound interest, on the other hand is a little bit different. So with compound interest, uh, compound interest is paid both on the original investment and on all interest that has been added to the original investment up to that point. So here, uh, the principal amount uh, changes every compounding period. And this, this will make a lot more sense when we look at some concrete examples. Uh, when we're given a compound interest formula, we'll be told uh, the amount, the interest is compounded monthly, or the amount is compounded weekly, or the amount is compounded uh, daily. So we'll have some compounding period. Um, so let's say it's compounded monthly. At the end of the first month, uh, the interest is calculated on the principal and that's added to the total. Then for the, the second month, you're calculating the principal, uh, you, sorry, you're calculating the interest on now the total amount in the investment on, on the, not, not only the original investment, but the amount of interest that was added for that first compounding period for that first month. Uh, so the principal amount changes over time. And again, that's good for uh, investments because then you get more money, uh, but it's bad for loans because then you owe more money. Uh, okay, now uh, when, when it comes to dealing with these financial formulas, um, we're going to use uh, powers and roots uh, in these formulas. So let's, let's uh, review some of the uh, properties of those. So review of powers and roots. And this can be found in the book on page 207. There is a, there is a big uh, review box, oops, 207. Uh, there is a, a fairly big box. I think it's almost the entire page that goes through the, the review of, of powers and roots. Um, I kind of want to just uh, skim through this really quickly. Um, a lot of this you've seen when we went over powers of 10, that's a special case where the base is 10. Um, uh, but the book will have a lot more examples on, on that page, on page 207. Uh, so let's start off with powers. So powers, you'd have something to a power a to the n, where here a is the base and n is the exponent. And so uh, you'd have things like, uh, for example, um, two to the first, that would be two, two squared would be two times two is four, two cubed would be two times two times two is eight. And then you can have negative exponents, two to the negative one is one over two, two to the negative two is one over two squared is one fourth and so on. Uh, so that is what we mean by power. So we have, uh, this is what we call exponential form. And this will appear in our, in our formulas, uh, which is why uh, in our financial formulas and our compounding formulas. Um, and for those of you that remember from previous math courses, what is anything to the zero power? One. One, very good. And I also saying that in the chat. Yes. 
So here, two to the zero would be one. Or you could look at powers of three. So you would have three of the first is three, three squared is nine, and so on. OK. Uh, rules of powers, we have three rules. Oh, let's get a fresh page here. So we have three rules, and these will look familiar because these we discussed when we looked at powers of 10. Uh, but I don't understand how the negatives get to be one half. How did that happen? Oh, um, so uh, when you have, let me get a different color here. Uh, when you have a to the negative n, uh, we define that as one over a to the n. So in this case, two to the negative one is one over two to the first power. So that would be one half. So the, um, the negative, when it goes over the fraction sign, becomes a positive. OK, uh, let's see. Where were we at? Here we are. OK, so our rules of powers, we have three of those. First one is if we multiply two things with the same base, a to the n times a to the m, we add the powers. And this we saw when we were looking at powers of 10. It was just powers of 10, it is a special case where the base is 10. So we'd have 10 to the n times 10 to the m is 10 to the n plus m. But this works for any base that we choose. So we could have base 2, base 3, whatever the base number is. Uh, 2, when we divide, a to the n divided by a to the m, we subtract. So this would be a to the n minus m. And the third rule we have is a to the n to the m power, a power to a power, we multiply the power. So we'd have a to the n times m. Uh, so those are our three rules. And again, I'm, I'm kind of going through these, these quickly. Um, I don't want to get to the, the meat of the of the material, uh, but the book does have a good review on on that. That uh, which which page was it? Two hundred seven, I believe. Yeah, two hundred seven. Okay. Next are roots. So roots. We have things like uh, take for example square root of nine. This I'm sure you've seen in, in a previous class, but what is square root of nine? Is three good. And that is because 3 squared is 9. We're asking what number when we square it gives us 9. So square root of 16 is 4 because we're asking what number when we square it gives us 16, and that is 4. So 4 squared equals 16. Now, with this, um, you will you <laughs> will probably never see this written in uh, But there is an understood 2 here uh, if you don't write any number. So 2 is the square root. We could have cube roots. Uh, yes, I see a question. I was going to ask, um, when it's like the square root, do we have to put like positive and negative? Um, that is not, uh, not in this case. Um, that would be if you, have, if you uh, take the square root of an equation of both sides of an equation than you do. Uh, but here, we're just given a number, just what is the square root of 9. So in that case, it's going to be positive. Uh, but if it was, uh, if we were solving an equation, x squared equals 9, and wanted to solve that, when we take the square root, we would get both a positive or a negative. Um, excuse me, what's the little 2 by the 16 that you colored in? What's that for? Um, so that's, that's uh, whenever you write square root, there's an understood 2 there. That's, that's what I mean by that. Um, and the reason for that is, well, the reason I write that is because next, when we look at, say, take, for example, cube roots, uh, cube root of 27, we're saying, um, what number, when we cube it, do we get 27? Whereas here with the square roots, we, we will never, you'll never see this 2 written. But it's 16 when we square it. What number when we square it? That's where the 2 comes from. Gives us 16. 
And so then when we, when we generalize it, we'll have another number there. Um, so that's that's just to kind of emphasize that that that's where this this uh, number comes from when you have cube roots and, and fourth roots and fifth roots. Um, but you'll never see it written with the two. Um, not entirely sure why. I remember there's a reason I can't think of it off the top of my head. Um, I haven't had enough coffee for that yet. Uh, but cube root of 27, uh, what is cube root of 27? Three. I think some, good, three. And I think someone already, already wrote that there at three. And that's because three cubed is 27. What about the cube root of eight? Two is two, and that's because two cubed is eight. And so then you can look at any any types of roots. You could have uh, fourth roots, fifth roots, sixth roots. Uh, square root is the most common. Um, but again, we don't we don't ever write that two there, even though it's it's understood to be there. Uh, next thing, this is the last part of uh, the review. And this is actually useful when we're using our calculators roots as fractional powers. Okay, now this is, this is the important bit that I wanted to get to in this review, uh, in this review box. And that is when we have the nth root of A then we can write that as a to the power of one divided by n. And this is useful, uh, especially in this, in this course, when we're using things like our calculator. Um, some of these calculators uh, don't have a, an nth root button. Some of them do, but it's very difficult to find. Uh, but if you have a power button, which, uh, or an exponent button, then you can always find uh, find roots. So let's, if we're looking at something like, like for example, uh, let's look at something that doesn't simplify. Uh, let's look at what is cube root of five. We want to know what cube root of five is. Well, it doesn't simplify. There's, uh, there is a number when we cube it that will give us five, but we don't know what it is off the top of our head. So what we could do is we can enter this into our calculator as five to the one third power. And so to enter that, we would type in our five and then our exponent button. Uh, now the exponent button is going to uh, differ depending on your calculator. It'll either be the caret button or uh, I think the other one that is most commonly used is y to the x, or it could be x to the y. Sometimes it switches those. Um, that's the power button. And then parentheses. And then we want our fraction one third, so one divided by three. And then our parentheses and equals, and this will give us the cube root of five. So take our calculator, and actually, even even in the same um, even in the same brand, some TIs use the caret key. This one does. Uh, other TIs I've seen actually have the y to the x key. So it it really depends on what uh, what the uh, uh, style of calculator you have, not, not necessarily even the brand. So we type that in, 5 to the power, parentheses, 1 divided by 3 equals, and let's round to two decimal places. In this case, we get 1.71. So we can find uh, roots with our calculator using the, uh, the definition of, of fractional powers. Um, So that's the review on powers. Uh, I'm going to, let's go ahead and stop there for now. So the next the next part we get into is the um, 1 point, yours says 1.7. It might be, it might be rounding. So you might want to, um, might want to check and see if it's on float or if it's on fixed. Uh, if it's fixed at one, then that would definitely give you 1.7. Okay, yeah, so that would that would be why. Um, 
Mine has 1.7099, so rounded would be 1.71, right? Yep, that's that's what mine has. Uh, seven point uh, 1.7099.75947. Um, uh, yeah, so there there should be a way to change that. Um, if your calculator is rounding, uh, there should be a way to fix that in the instructions um, that come with it. Or or if you need help, let me know and I'll I'll take a look at it. Um, sorry. Okay. Uh, the next part of this section would be simple interest. We get into the uh, simple interest equation and the compound interest equation. Um, but uh, again, I don't want to over overwhelm you with with uh, homework or or things. So because I want you to finish, uh, I want you to focus and finish on uh, the project. Um, although there was one thing I wanted to say. What was it? Oh, the so the financial equations, the equation on simple interest and compound interest. Those two equations will be given. I'm going to repeat this next lecture, so don't have to worry about that. Uh, they will be given, uh, but it won't be labeled which equation is which, and you won't be told what the variables mean. Uh, we're going to go over all of that next class and how to use the equation, but you will have the, uh, the equation actually given on the exam. Um, so you won't have to memorize the equation itself. What you will have to memorize is which equation is which, so which one is simple interest, which one is compound interest, and you'll also have to memorize what do the uh, variables mean. Um, but that's that's uh, also going to be a little bit easier with financial formulas. They will all more or less uh, mean the same thing. P will be principal and well, we'll get into the rest next class. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and end there. Uh, if you haven't typed here in the chat, uh, type here now. Uh, good, all right. <laughs> I just saw that question. No, yeah. So it still counts. Just just make sure you type in here now if you if you uh, came in later if you're having some computer issues. Um, let me go ahead and stop the sh screen share and stop the recording here.